Hello, my name is Jessica and this is my presentation exploring the roles of healthcare professionals and more specifically midwives. When you hear the word midwife, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Is it someone kind and supportive or somebody's forceful and unrelenting? Maybe you think of your own birthing experiences or perhaps something you've read in the news. In this presentation, I'm going to explore the development and challenges of the role of a midwife and consider the public's current perception of these professionals. The word midwife means with women. Midwives are healthcare professionals that support and care for women and their families throughout pregnancy and birth and provide postnatal support as well. This could be done in a hospital, in a GP surgery or also in the individual's home. Although over 99% of UK midwives are women, the role isn't restricted to gender, but relies on a person's character instead. The NHS expects their midwives to demonstrate six key attributes at all times, and these are compassion, care, courage, communication, commitment and competence. Midwifery has developed over time and the profession has changed quite considerably throughout the years. Back in ancient Greece, it was a formal profession that was allowed to be undertaken by mothers who were past childbearing age, um, who were respected as medical professionals. However, in the UK, um, it was actually more of a casual role and it was performed by female family members or specific female members of the community. In the 1800s, male physicians developed things like the forceps and they began to take over the role in more of a professional capacity. However, women were still quietly working away as midwives within the communities, and in 1881, Matron's Aid was set up, which actually became the basis of institutes like the Royal College of Midwives. And in the early 1900s, midwifery became a legally recognised profession. The profession further developed with the creation of the NHS, blood transfusions, and the introduction of antibiotics, which made childbirth much safer. But even today, midwives strive to ensure that the service is the best that it possibly can be. As you can see from the slide, midwives have many responsibilities. During antenatal care, they do things such as blood tests, examinations and classes and workshops. It's also their responsibility to identify any health concerns that may cause the pregnancy to become high risk. They must provide the pregnant person with any information regarding healthy eating and exercise and also help them understand their options when forming a birthing plan. During the labour, the midwife will act as a guide, taking them through the labour stages, being supportive and encouraging and acting as an advocate for the person where possible. After the birth, they'll assess the newborn, suture any tears and do approximately two hours worth of paperwork. After the birth, midwives will be on hand to answer any questions the new parents might have and provide information on feeding and caring for their baby. They'll also be able to help with post-birth issues such as constipation, bleeding, incontinence and piles. Unfortunately, some babies die shortly before or after they're born and in this case the midwife will need to give as much support as she can to the parents. This could be by listening to them as they grieve, leaving them alone to allow them to have space to process or by helping them to dress and cuddle their newborns. Not all midwives work for the NHS, some are hired and paid independently to support women throughout the process. They will go into the hospitals with them during labour, but they don't act as the main midwife during the birth. As a midwife progresses through her career, the responsibilities she has will increase, and this is often reflected in the pay band that she receives. If you look in the top corner of my slide, you will see some examples of this bracket. Midwives will need to work with many other healthcare professionals in what is known as a multidisciplinary team to ensure that they can provide the best care possible for their patients. Um, there are various roles that are undertaken elsewhere in the ward and around the hospital and some examples are people like maternity support workers. Um, they're not as qualified as midwives but they're actually on hand in the wards and they work alongside the midwives to provide support. Obstetricians are needed for about 35% of births and they're called in if the baby becomes distressed. They can do things like um, support with the use of forceps or suction and they also provide um, emergency caesareans as well. Anaesthetists, of course, work alongside that. They provide anaesthetic for planned and emergency caesareans and also during labour. 
Um, it might also be necessary for midwives to liaise with neonatal nurses or paediatricians if the newborn baby is sick or premature. Um, and also people like newborn hearing screeners who will come in and actually test the hearing of the baby. It's not just medical staff that midwives will need to liaise with, they will also need to be in contact with other bodies, um, charities and non-medical staff. Um, an example of this can be the Royal College of Midwives who will frequently get in contact with surveys and they work with midwives to influence government policies and um, to try and enforce safer working conditions. The Nursing and Midwifery Council regulate all practising midwives and they'll investigate any serious concerns so it can be necessary for midwives to work with them as well in any investigations. Um, and also sometimes uh, for safeguarding reasons it might be necessary to liaise with the police or social services if um, a person might be suffering from domestic violence, if they've got a history of violence themselves or a dependency on drug and alcohol, um, it will be necessary to liaise with them to ensure the well-being of the patient and also their baby as well. Sometimes midwives might need to refer their patients on for other reasons as well, um, including to other healthcare professionals. Uh, for example, if they're worried about their patient due to any illnesses or previous birth complications, they might call in an obstetrician. Um, if they diagnose their patient with diabetes, they'll refer them on to a dietitian to help them through the pregnancy. Uh, similarly, if any mental health issues are raised, they'll be referred on to a specialist mental health midwife um, that will support that person through their journey as well. Um, and in such cases where there's a concern raised about the care provided by the midwives themselves or any of the other supporting staff on the ward, um, it might be necessary to refer the patient on to the head of midwifery so they can investigate and dis discuss with the family um, and try to put any worries they have at ease. Midwifery is now a legalised and regulated profession and all registered midwives must adhere by the code produced by the Nursing and Midwifery Council. The five key principles are listed below and these are prioritising people, practising efficiently, preserving safety and promoting professionalism and trust. All medical professionals must maintain boundaries with their patients to ensure that they can provide them with the best possible care. They shouldn't allow any personal beliefs or opinions to affect their work and they shouldn't behave in a way that allows the patient to understand their private thoughts. All patients should be treated with respect even if their choices don't coincide with that of the midwife or the doctor. Emotions can be quite heightened during the birthing experience and a midwife's role is always to guide the person safely through the labour experience. They will need to build a rapport with them and encourage a sense of trust. So although they will need to be professional, they will also need to demonstrate their humanity. Interestingly, some patients will benefit from a kind word, but others will need a kind but firm approach. And it is the midwife's responsibility to judge these situations and ensure that she behaves accordingly. However, just because something is law doesn't mean that it's always practiced. Body autonomy is the first principle of medical ethics and midwives and doctors must ensure that they obtain informed consent before they undertake any procedure on a person. Sadly, even today, charities and support groups are still discussing the issue of consent with many people feeling that they weren't informed or even told that a procedure was going to occur. This can relate to things such as vaginal examinations, suturing and inductions. All midwives must remember person-centred care and they must ensure that they obtain consent and report anybody that doesn't. Sometimes the law and ethics can feel at odds and a midwife may struggle to do her job without feeling that she's doing something wrong. An example of this is the use of medical intervention and resuscitation on premature babies. At 23 weeks, a baby is deemed unviable and therefore medical intervention wouldn't usually be provided. But at 24 weeks, it's deemed viable and medical help would be given to try and ensure that the baby can survive. With only a week's difference, the midwife will be expected to act differently at each birth and this can naturally have an emotional impact. It's important to note, though, that in 2020, the British Association of Prenatal Medicine actually released new information regarding viability at 23 weeks. So it is possible that the guidelines will change, but the question will remain as to whether or not it will feel ethical to those that have to perform based upon it. Politics obviously has a huge impact. Um, on society and healthcare is no exception. 
Um, Brexit is a really good example of how politics can have a knock on effect in the healthcare industry um, and possibly in ways that you wouldn't necessarily consider when you're watching the news. Um, so in the UK at the moment, there are 51,000 midwives and a national shortage of approximately 2,500. Back in 2015, before Brexit uh, was well underway, we received from other countries uh, just over 9,000 midwives a year that would come across to work in the UK. Um, and in terms of those leaving the UK, it was just under 2,000. And fortunately, in 2019, uh, post Brexit or during the Brexit negotiations, the number of uh, midwives coming over and registering in the UK dropped considerably. Um, as you can see from my slide, only 913 midwives came over and registered, which is a humongous decline um, and really has a long term impact on healthcare, not just in terms of midwifery, but you've got the same kind of numbers reflected with nurses and doctors. Um, and the national shortages, you know, are pretty self-explanatory in that case. Um, of all those that opted to leave, 50% uh, of them actually cited Brexit as their reason. COVID-19 has had a huge impact on everyone's lives over the last year. Um, and this has been felt quite keenly within maternity and by women and their families during the birthing process. Birth rights are a 300% increase in calls during the months of April to September last year, um, primarily caused to the lockdown when it was uh, made that trusts would be able to make decisions on partner restrictions. Um, individually. There was no official guidelines for this. It was independent trust choice and lots of trusts took the action that partners wouldn't be allowed to scans, um, antenatal tests and wouldn't be allowed through the initial stages of labour or for extended periods of time after delivery. Um, this obviously had a huge impact on mental health as a result. There was a lot of feelings of isolation and distress uh, petitions have been raised, campaigns of awareness have been raised and uh, government politicians have been weighing in as well as charities to try and ensure that more thought is given to the impact of these decisions. Um, no one really knows yet how it's going to affect people in the long run, if there's going to be an increase in uh, postpartum depression, if it's going to affect bonding and things like that. Um, at the moment, we do know that it's affecting uh, the strain that's being put on certain hospitals where they've got more lenient decisions than other trusts in the area. Um, so there's a, a lack of uh, continuity as well across the trust. So I think it's obviously an ongoing issue. There's no easy uh, end in sight. There's no easy decisions to be made. But it's important that in this regard, the hospitals are listening to their patients. They're listening to the other medical providers and they're listening to the charities. To try and make the best decisions for everybody involved. To help me understand the public perception of midwives, I conducted a short survey of 10 questions to try and ascertain that people's understanding of the role. I received 25 responses and out of those, almost all participants selected positive words in association with midwives, with the first three being supportive, kind and knowledgeable. There seemed to be some misunderstanding about the qualifications needed by a midwife, though, as most believed that a foundation degree would be sufficient and one person believed that no formal qualifications were required at all. Over 70% of the participants described their own birthing experiences as positive and the other 30 described themselves as neutral. My survey implies that there is a positive public image of midwives despite negative publicity and that further awareness could be encouraged regarding how qualified midwives actually are. These are some of the free comments that were left on my survey, which I thought were quite interesting and you might want to have a look at.